Um, I'm Elaine Sullivan. I'm an Egyptologist and a digital humanist, and I am the project coordinator for Digital Karnak. And I'm now an assistant professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Yeah, that's great. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to give um, those here and um, anyone listening in a little bit more information um, on the model version that we're going to be sharing today. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Digital Karnak Project website, where there are videos, teaching guides, photographs of the temple, um, all created for university level instruction. The model that we're flying today was completed in 2008 for the Digital Karnak Project um, and designed in a modeling software called Creator from the Canadian company Presagia. Um, each figure visualized or each feature visualized in the model was designed based on published research from Karnak. And Karnak is a site that's been excavated for more than 100 years, so we have a huge amount of already scholarly reviewed published content on the site. Now, the full Karnak model traces 32 major phases of construction and renovation at the temple across more than 2,000 years of the temple's lifespan. For this annotation and citation experiment today, we could not visit, um, feasibly use the whole model as the quantity of published <coughs> information is so vast. So we chose to select a section of the model following Karnak from the beginning of the 18th dynasty in about 1525 BCE um, in the reign of King Amenhotep I through the reign of eight total kings up to Amenhotep III um, around 1350 BCE. So we're following basically only 200 years of the temple's 2,000-year lifespan. Um, I've been working with Lisa and Joy for more than a year to annotate the Karnak model and create narratives that show how documentation and argumentation can be made within the 3D world. We heavily annotated these eight phases, including brief descriptions of each architectural feature, specific information on the reconstruction choices that we made in the model, photographs of those features in modern times from Karnak, from our own trip to Karnak, citations to bibliography, and links to outside sources. Um, there's a total of 626 annotations in the model, which basically averages out to around 78 per chronological period that we um, did for this, of this citation. Um, our goal with merging digital Karnak into BSIM is to provide a test case for others ready to integrate 3D content into research and publication. So we hope that by packaging our work into this sort of downloadable, interactive resource that we could demonstrate the concept of foreign digital scholarship as a rich replacement for traditional printed scholarly argument. So Lisa has um, the model in BSIM up um, and we are here looking at the first phase, the earliest phase that's represented in our experiment today, which is that of Amenhotep the first. And you can see that on the top bar, we have a series of um, narratives, or these are thumbnails that link to our narratives. We have an uh, introduction to digital Karnak, where we provide some very basic information about the model, some of the choices we made, and instructions on how to interact with the model. We have a chronology narrative that goes through all eight phases that we have created for this, um, that we've annotated for this experiment and talks about the major additions of each different king. We have a narrative on the early temple so that's um, looking at just some of the earliest phases and those uh, renovations. We have a thematic uh, narrative that focuses specifically on the obelisks of the temple um, only two of the original 15 obelisks that would have stood at Karnak stand there today. So this is um, an attempt to think about the impact of those buildings at the temple. We have a specific, another thematic um, narrative that deals with one room in the temple that went through um, five or six architectural changes within the reigns of four successive kings, so a really condensed um, architectural changes that are happening in a very short period of time. Then we have a, um, a narrative on the Bark Shrine and buildings of Chepsut and Chepsut the third, um, who are two very important um, music kings. And then we have a narrative that specifically talks about the reconstructions at the, um, at the end of the 18th dynasty 
uh, King Telphos is the fourth, and Amenhotep the third, third. So it's sort of the last phase in this chronological moment. So these narratives you can then open, and these take you through the space as if they were a sort of PowerPoint within 3D space. They allow you to jump between um, important points, but also to play the narrative and sort of move seamlessly through our um, argument and tour of Carmack. So Lisa's going to open our first one, the introduction. So we start off with talking about um, the model, the creation of the model, the data of the model, and the interface software, and how this was created to give people some background on the project. Um, we've included figures within the digital Karnak model. This is um, something that we thought was really important after we got initial feedback from showing the model. Is people really felt they had no sense of scale in the 3D space. And so we've created a single figure that we repeat over and over throughout the model that is always the same height. I think it's 1.65 meters or 1.6 meters. So that anytime you're moving through space, you have a sense of how big are these monuments that we're talking about because Karnak scale is really immense. Um, and that doesn't come through without having some kind of um, scale figure. We talk here about the technique that we use for texturing the relief within the model. Um, in a, a small number of places, we use transparency to show that buildings were intended to be built or started to be built but not finished in the reign of that king. And here we give an overview of the time periods of each of these eight kings, um, as well as a little a sort of brief um, description of how the time slider um, works in terms of what are the rain dates of those kings. Um, and then here we suggest different kinds of interaction. There's uh, multiple ways of interacting with the model that we took advantage of in the digital Karnak VSIM version. Um, we, the first interaction is by playing the narrative, which is, of course, what you're doing right now. Um, then there's another means of interaction, which is using the embedded resources. So over um, at the bottom of the screen, you can bring up the embedded resources, and on the right is a category called global resources. And these are resources that are available um, anytime when you are within the correct, within a specific chronological range of a king, all of his um, global resources, his or her local resources will show up. And this allows you to actually click through um, and choose one structure at a time um, and see all of the buildings that were created by that king. Um, you might want to show that time slider reference first. Uh, oh. So um, also useful is that at any point in global resources, you can get to our time slider reference, which tells you the time slider date of each individual king because we realized that um, those are not necessarily things that everyone would know. <laughs> and finally, there's free form exploration. So at any time from an embedded resource, from a narrative, you can always go live in the model and move around real time, 360 degrees, and control your own movement. And then when you want to jump back into a narrative or get back to your embedded resource, you can always rejoin those spaces. But this allows us to, while, while we as content creators can sort of show you a tour or create an argument that you can follow, um, you're not limited to following that. Um, you can go and investigate other parts of the temple or go and look 360 degrees around something that we've modeled so that it's not just the one view that we've decided is the right view that you should have, but you can actually decide what view you think is important for evaluating that argument. Um, so here we just talk about interacting with the narratives that you can um, turn on and off those bars at the top of the screen so that it's um, out of your way if you don't want to see the thumbnails that lead you through the narrative. And here we give directions on changing the time slider. This is one of the most complicated things about this model is that at any given time, um, in order for the text that goes along with the narrative to make sense, you need to be in the right king's reign. 
So here we have um, a calendar that always shows you what date your time slider should be um, slid to. And then we use the red calendar to, um, to mark to the viewer that this is the moment to slide, to time slide, to change your date. Um, and this is just a key to the graphics legend. So when we have the P sign, it means you need to press play in order to move to the next um, slide or node in our narrative. And then again, the calendar in black, just a reminder showing you what date you should be on, and then a red um, if you are supposed to time slide on that narrative slide. We also have embedded resources at the lower part of the screen. And some of these, um, like in this case, will just pop up automatically. Others you can, you can access from the base of the screen. Um, and you can choose which ones you want to look at. So at any given time, um, you can choose to go to a global resource, or you can choose to look at a local resource. And those are resources that are spatially aware. So they will change depending on where you are within the temple. Um, but you can choose to just ignore those if you want, or you can choose to navigate freely through the temple and click on these local resources and learn about that specific zone of the temple as you control your own. Shall I click on a few of these? Sure. A number of the embedded resources um, replace the positioning um, to give you what we consider to be sort of the best view of that feature. So here we want to um, show you the obelisk, so we've centered those in the screen. <coughs> here we've moved around so that you can directly see into the watch at home using this feature index or our global resources. And this is an overview giving you basic information on that reign of the king. And if you're experienced lag on um, the WebEx connection, that's an artifact of the WebEx connection. So it's a smoother movement if you're experiencing this interactively live. So one of the other things that we've tried to do to make this legible to our user is that our embedded resources we have color-coded um, so that each of those resources that come in along the bottom has a, um, an individual color. So things that link out to the Digital Karnak website are labeled with red. Um, comments on where we got the information for our reconstruction or issues with possible different um, scholarly reconstruction ideas are done in a sort of mustard yellow. Um, the feature index is done in brown. Um, views of render, site photos are in two colors of blue. Links to video of the model are in purple. Links out to other web resources are in another color of brown. And then specific bibliography is in gray. So if you have an interest as a researcher and you know that you're just interested in looking at the reconstruction nodes, you can quickly tell which of those um, local resources are of interest to you, just by color. And we've created this custom for Karnak, but anyone creating their own project would use whichever colors they wanted to um, symbolize other things and whatever categories they want. So um, this just reminds the viewer of these different types of, um, of navigation. So you can do this sort of fly through like we're showing you here in this narrative. Um, but there's also other ways of interacting with the model for people who are um, more used to Google Earth version or gaming version using their uh, keyboard. You're seeing that we're having these automatic pop-ups come in because we are now close enough to these obelisks that the embedded resources that we've keyed as um, coming in automatically are showing up. Now, as we're moving through the temple, do you want to um, open the embedded resources at the base? You'll see that the embedded resources that are popping in, both in the navigation screen as well as the local resources, are changing as we're moving through the temple because, again, these are spatially aware, and they pop in and out as we have um, approached their point of, um, of activation, and then they leave as we leave their circle of activation. Go 
what I do for Caltech Capital. Oh, sure, go into the, yeah, why don't you go into the shop bowl. Um, I'm going to time slide back. Yeah. To the first 15 tabs. So one of the um, things that we worked on doing to add some value to this content was also repositioning some of the imagery. So when Lisa clicks on the um, embedded resources for site photos, these will actually reposition the screen um, to show the same view as the image in the Digital Karnak website. So you can compare the modern Calcite Chapel, the reconstruction at Karnak today, with that of the model. If you go inside a little bit, Lisa, then you'll see a number of the other ones. So here we're showing the um, low or high resolution photographs of the interior of the relief on the Digital Karnak website. And then you can see those same um, reliefs as textures within the model and understand where their context is within the Calcite Chapel. As well, um, we've tried to add some commentary on some of these themes um, so that the viewer within the model actually has a little bit of narrative about um, what are they looking at? What is the team doing? Um, providing a little extra content. You double click on that one, Lisa, and rearrange to there. Order me around. What do you want to do? Okay, so why don't you? Um, back out, and I think there's still a few more slides in this narrative. And then at the end of all of our narratives, we um, just give a short credit page so that you know that you're at the end. Okay, so let's start with, um, we'll do the chronology narrative. So this is a, a narrative that takes us through Karnak as a temporal model to so looking at an overview of these eight phases that we've annotated. So it's a web browser. Yeah. So here we remind our user again of what our graphics legend is. and we give clear reference to where you're supposed to be in the model at each moment. And so here we're talking about the earliest phases of Karnak, looking at um, a Middle Kingdom <coughs> temple structure that was changed during the reign of Amenhotep I as we um, move out from a very small, um, possibly not very important temple into the monument that um, will become sort of the most important religious center in all of history. So here we're marking the major additions of this individual king. And then we're asking our viewer to move um, to the next reign. Where we have the addition of um, large stone pylons, and the first obelisks at the temple in the reign of Tuffus the first. We're also highlighting some of the other important additions that he made, including um, 
statuaries of the king as the god of Cyrus in these courts. We're then going to the reign of Chalcosus II. And again, we're doing a lot of these from overhead views because we want um, the viewer to be able to see these as holistic, sort of large scale changes of the temple. And he has added um, a new festival court to Karnak and a pylon in front of the um, pylon of Chalcosus the first. Then we're time sliding to the reign of Queen Hatshepsut, who has added in a new um, palace of Ma'at and the Red Chapel at the Karnak very central zone. Um, and then we're also looking at a number of other additions that Hatshepsut made, including within that um, hall with statuary of Tufnosis I, called the Watchet Hall. For two monumental obelisks that she also added to the temple. And then a new pylon solidifying um, a processional route towards the south, towards the Temple of Moot. Um, and we're showing here as well the position or the hypothetical position of the Nile River at this time. And then we're asking our viewer to move back and forth to time slide, sort of back and forth to see how um, the movement of the Nile to the west um, is related to the growth of the temple. Then we're moving to the reign of the next king, Tuthmosis III, who adds a huge number of um, features to the temple. So we're going to look at a few of those. Um, his new obelisk and the seventh pylon really creating this southern axis way um, in a new substantial way, as well as his building of a sacred lake. Um, he also added additions to that Watchet Hall to the um, Hall of Statuary, which I'll focus first. And um, at some uh, later period in his reign, he also added in um, a enclosure, completely enclosed with the ceiling, that specific hall. And he um, adds in a number of pylons and courts along the Palace of Ma'at in the central zone of Karnak, really completely changing that space. <coughs> and then there are um, a number of new additions to East Karnak which are being highlighted here, a new a Contra temple at the rear of Karnak, as well as the King's Festival Hall called the Achmenu. And probably a monumental mud brick wall along the east edge of Karnak. Then time sliding to the next king's reign, Amenhotep II, um, we see in our model, we basically added a transparent polygon here. Um, this was a way for us to represent the fact that there was a court built by Amenhotep II that has been completely destroyed, and the bricks from which were used by a later king in a series of constructions, but we don't have um, enough evidence to reconstruct what that would look like, so we sort of placed this transparent polygon here to show that something has happened, but we're not really ready to model it in yet. <coughs> and then we're also showing a small, a much smaller construction that he added inside of the temple space. Um, we're looking at a small shrine added by Amenhotep II into this 
festival court at the front of the temple. And then in the reign of Tutmosis IV, we're adding in a columned peristyle, um, as well as a series of small chapels that that king added to um, this main entrance to Karnak. And then in the reign of Amatochus III, the last king represented in our experiment, um, we see the complete destruction of that entire, almost the entire festival court, and the replacement of it with Amatochus um, III's third pylon. As well as the addition of um, the start of the tenth pylon along that uh, north-south processional axis. So here we're asking our viewer to move the time slider back and forth and look at these eight phases of construction um, and think about what this tells us in terms of the Egyptian king's willingness to completely renovate, destroy um, the work of their immediate predecessors, sometimes their own father, um, and their, what this tells us about their sense of the temple space. Um, also, that many of these constructions you cannot see at Karnak today because they were obviously destroyed at later periods. Um, so this really gives us a sense of which king was building where and um, and how their an individual reign's construction impacted the overall temple space. Any thoughts or questions at this point before we continue? Okay, Elaine, tell me what to do. Okay, that's not the end yet. Press play again. There's a few more on here. So this is just giving um, another another viewpoint looking from the south, um, and we're also sort of asking uh, the viewer to think about these these new routes that are being built, um, these new access ways in the north and south, and how these um, access ways were integrated with the larger Theban landscape. And that's our end slide. <laughs> <laughs> so we like to do at the end of each narrative a bibliography that lists um, the works that we've directly cited within um, the narrative text. Would you like to talk about another narrative? Would you like to talk about the feature index again or freeform exploration? What would you all like to see? Reform exploration, maybe? Why don't you do that? Okay, take a time period. I'm in Am Amenhotep the third. I like the motion the third. Okay. So what date would that be? I think it's um wait, we can look at our reference. 50, uh, we've got two time slides. Fourteen fifty or fourteen thirty five. Thirty five is better than yet. All of it. Okay. okay. So the feature index. Covers. Why don't you go into the ox menu, Lisa, and then we can, why don't you fly in there and click on some of the embedded resources that, the local embedded resources that pop up when you move through that space. Very careful. <laughs> she doesn't want to crash the service. So here as you're entering the building, we've attached automatic pop-ups that 
sort of if you're walking in through the door that are telling you what's the building that you're walking in through, um, what is the importance or function of this building as you're sort of entering through a traditional walking at human eye level space. Um, and then we're going to get into the main hall of the Ox menu, the main pillar hall. Um, and this is one of the only spaces in Karnak where we have recreated um, color effects because uh, this room has extraordinarily preserved color and paint in Karnak today. So we were actually able to do this without making a lot of um, hypothetical judgments. So as you move through this space then, um, different embedded resources should be popping up um, giving you um, pictures from Karnak today. So why don't you click on that one, Lisa, the site photo. So here you can actually compare then what does this space look like today. You can see some of those um, the color and paint on those pillars. You can compare the fact that we haven't actually modeled all of the color. You can see on those, um, right, exactly on the architrave, there are large cartouches that we have not added to the model. Um, so it gives you a little bit of um, of access to the appearance of the temple today. And we've tried in many cases to set up these views to be rather, to be quite similar so you can actually compare these spots in the temple with, um, in the model of the temple with the temple today. Yeah, maybe just click on one of the digital card act resources that's come in. Okay, so just telling you where you are in the major section of the temple, as well as a little bit of general information on the hall. What is its name in Egyptian? Um, when was it built? Why was it built? And the major publications, the bibliography for who has um, who's the information that we're using to do this, the reconstruction model. What are the, the abbreviations, the F1? Oh, sure, that's a great, that's a great question. Point. Lisa, why don't you answer? One of the challenges as we're thinking of this as a publication is to think about how it could be cited by others. So if, for example, you had a scholar who was interested in Karnak and was um, wanting to reference our computer model, they can, on the narrative, reference a node number. So each, each narrative node has a number, and each embedded resource has a unique number. So we set up F as the, as the um, front initial for Tetmosis III, so all, all embedded resources related to Tetmos is the third, start with S. Each feature has its own then sub-index, and beyond that, each individual resource has its own alpha, alpha character. So F1B, uh, you know, we do show all, um, all the extreme instructions. So you can see F1K, or F1 is all Akmenu, F2 is Contra Temple, F3 the Seventh Pylon, F4 Tetmosis the Third Shrine, F5 Sacred Lake. Lisa would, it be <clears throat> Lisa, would it be possible to also tag those, let's say, and go back out to WorldCat to see where a particular source might be or, um, you know, who has it in what collection? Well, theoretically, as long as the WorldCat URL for that search is stable, yes, of course. Also, Lisa, will you open the narrative and show the um, the node numbers? We talk about Akhmenu in the Bark Shrine. In Bark Shrine, yeah. So here, this is just node five. And our idea is that if you are going to use text to create an argument within the three D space, you want people to be able to cite that argument as if they would a page number in a book. So here, um, Marie could have something to say about my node number nine, um, and so she would be able to cite that as the, the place where she was having a conversation with me about why she disagrees with me. Okay. Um, I also noticed there's a little corner highlights on some of them. What does that indicate? That that means if you launch it, you'll be repositioned. Okay. So, so it's a 
warning that if you don't want to lose where you are in the 3D space, do not double click on it. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can single click to read it. So this okay. one, uh, it says, this is a rendering of the Red Chapel. The interior view is from the vestibule looking through the doors of the sanctuary. So when I launch it, it will launch that and reposition us to a match view. Right. But we know sometimes people don't want to be repositioned and they could find that annoying. So that's kind of a warning that once you've figured out how it works, if you want to stay where you are, you can just read the text without getting the reposition. Um, so Lisa, why don't you fly into that first court and move around by the obelisk? because that's a good example of one of the challenges of doing the spatially aware um, embedded resources. So when you get into um, architectural spaces that have lots of different features within them, um, this does become a challenge because you have a lot of local resources popping up at the same time. Um, and you can be, for example, looking in a different direction but still within the activation zone of a local resource. Um, so this does become a little bit um, problematic. So we tried really hard, and Joy tried really hard, to sort of narrow the zones of activation down to a tight enough zone around the monument that you had to be pretty close before they would activate. Um, so it was a real choice that we had to make for every single feature. How close was so close that people would miss the local activation? because they weren't close enough to get it to show, versus um, when they show too broadly, you can be looking at eight different monuments and have no idea which one of those monuments is being activated. So this is a bit of a, um, a sort of game you have to play when creating these spatially aware resources. So this one, for example, clicks to, this, this text is about the west obelisks of festival halls. So that's this westernmost pair and the ones that are right next to us, standing very, very close to us. There's a URL here, so if I double click and launch it, it takes to the discussion on the Digital Karnak website about that pair. We could have not clicked that and been fine, but just to show you. And I'm gonna move around until the next one pops up. So now here, we're just generally seeing information about the festival court in Pylon. Now we've got information coming up about the White Chapel. But you can see we had to get pretty close to it before it activated. Is the choice to link the, the embedded resources to a spatial area, which is not visually defined, or instead of interacting with objects, clicking on them, or having them highlight, or things like that, was that a design choice? Was that like due to the constraints of the technology or it's actually a design choice in doing the software because the software is intended to be generalizable for any kind of content and the the task of choosing objects and associating to objects I, I just wasn't willing to try to chase that down so we just said proximity and spatially aware sensor the, the um, enhancement to this is a combination of proximity. Right now we trigger things when we are in kind of the spherical moment of influence. Um, the, the enhancement is taking that spherical moment of influence and being able to carve it down to perhaps a viewing direction so that something triggers only when you are within its bounding region and you are moving in the same direction as, we are, as, as that viewpoint has been set. So that gets to be a little more sophisticated, but it also gets to be more problematic because people don't then necessarily match up to that kind of constrained viewing question. In the real world, you walk through a type of garden, you see trees, you see what kind of trees is this, and there's a little plaque. plaque. <laughs> through the plaque, right. you see the trees. Right. So this basically works a little bit the same. You just have to walk up to it. Yeah. Because Right. And yes. so we're hoping that yes. as the user sort of uses it more, these kinds of things become intuitive, that they realize, oh, I need to get 
close to this object in order for the information to, to pop up. And so once they've done that a few times, then they just, that becomes intuitive to them that, okay, you've got to go close to, to get this material so that you're not getting a lot of extraneous um, embedded resources that don't have anything to do with the space that you're inside or what you're looking at. Have you thought about <clears throat> doing a YouTube description with a voice on all of the basic maneuvering tools? No, but that's a great idea. Um, we have posted now um, a tutorial that I gave on how to use the software. Yeah. We have posted a short um, and that's a YouTube one, right? That's a YouTube yeah. one. A short clip uh, for... For Karnak? Or for Not for Karnak. No, oh, I think for Karnak. We actually are recording this session right now. With <laughs> 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 intent to post. So, yeah. But it's true. I mean, because this model is... The temporal phasing of it means it's so much more complicated than most yeah. models um, that it might be really useful to have a guideline that actually matches up with this specific model. And especially in 3D environments, I think if you see it and how to do it, rather yeah. than read how to do it, yeah, or, and as we talked about yesterday, if all of the instructions are at the beginning and you kind of, you're anxious to play right. in the environment, you go through them so fast and then you go, oh, i got to go back, where is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that gives everyone, um, uh, having seen the Red Shuffle this morning and then this, um, I think maybe we should just have a little bit more of a discussion and, okay. yeah, then we can turn. <laughs> <laughs> so questions or comments? You know what I'd like to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we should, and Lisa wants us to be specific about both comments about the system itself as well as comments about the Karnak model and then also how we're using VSIM in the Karnak model. So all all three of those categories. So having modeled many, many years and written a few applications, I understand that uh, sometimes there's a lot of work behind simple comments. But what would really be <laughs> useful, I think, is when you're, especially when you're in the interior spaces without any other plane of reference, to have a small plan that shows where you are in this complex. That would actually, or some sort of uh, compass. Yes, that, I, I like the compass idea slightly better. I'm torn on that. Yeah, I know why. That. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm torn on that. And, and I refer to like Unity environments mm -hmm. like Virtual Rosewood. It's a rural environment and the, the two map options are either keep the map oriented true north or spin the map as you spin around so you're always going forward. Mm -hmm. And there are challenge, spatial challenges with both. If you're always orienting the map true north, then when you are aiming south as one navigating through the environment, right. you have to like do that spatial flip. Right. If you're spinning the environment or spinning the map to orient to the direction you are orienting, then your map could theoretically just be spinning wildly as you navigate through the space. Um, so I think for me, maps are problematic, but mm -hmm. I understand that for other people it's desirable. Um, Is there a way to do a Google Earth style overlay of the terrain that you can toggle on and off with the model so you can kind of see it? And the texture on the, on the ground? Um, I guess you would do in Google Earth if you had a like just an image file and you do referenced it, and then you could have that as a base layer, like in HyperCities, mm -hmm. and then toggle them the models on and off to see. Do we have that in the original model file? Right, because that's how we actually placed right. all of our architecture was on the base plan. Right. So that would just be a question of including that in this model and adding in another feature of the turning on and off. Yeah. Because I, I kind of agree with Lisa on, I, I totally understand the disorientation of being within Karnak, 
but A, I actually think that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> because I want people to have the sense of, oh my gosh, I don't know where I am, this is huge, this is gigantic, this is so complicated, because I think that's part of the effect of when you go to Karnak, you don't know where you are. Um, and there's so much going on in terms of real estate on the screen with the top bar, the bottom bar, the embedded resource pop-ups, and the text narrative, as well as the mm -hmm. same space, that I'm worried that more um, things to be looking at on the screen is, is too much. It's already, I feel like there's a lot going on. Um, but I do, I can imagine that an actual base layer that you could turn on and off would provide that in a different way. Yeah, it, it might also be useful for other types of arguments where you're trying to show how different the constructions actually work out of these. Not necessarily for the navigation part, uh, but for making other kinds of arguments. I do think that the north arrow is a, a good idea. I, I, I uh, uh, that's like you do a couple of maps. No, no, I, no. no. <laughs> and I'm really experienced in getting lost in Karnak. <laughs> what, what I do when I'm lost is I fly up through the roof, get the overview, basically the map, and then sort of drop down where I need to be. Yeah, right. I mean, the feature index is supposed to function in a way that the user that sort of understands how we set this up is that every single feature, if you want to go to some place, and hit that feature index, it takes you that, that your monument is centered in the screen. So you can always get out and back and center whatever it is that you want to explore um, from that feature index. So we've created a way that you can't always sort of return to home, right, in order to get back in and out. And so that's one way that we've allowed the user to sort of not be completely lost in I guess it's not, not for just getting lost in the space, but it's kind of from a different standpoint. I'm not familiar with Egypt as much as you are, so kind of knowing where Karnak is in relation to the Nile, in relation to other sites, uh, <coughs> that's kind of the information that I would <coughs> like to have. So it's, it may not be relevant to your argument at all in this right. particular context. So and also just comes from my uh, background in working with GIS and the, that kind of stuff. So I always zoom out and I see the larger map topography and then zoom into the site, which is just what I'm used to. So it's yeah. something like yeah, so like Google Earth and uh, so it it might not even be relevant to this sort of a application. I mean, one since we have paired it with the digital current right. website. So one mm -hmm. option might be to encourage people yeah. to go to the digital Yeah, because something like that, that is usually what I use to uh, is have a, um, a new embedded resource that's the link to the right face of the map. That would so be great. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, or they, they don't have different URLs. So no, they don't have different URLs. But at least it could be a face to the map telling you which yeah. moment in yeah. time flutter you should go to. Or so jump to a period. Jump to period so you could follow along the right. second window, and that would really... That would, that would be great. That would be yeah. really so that's a great idea. Getting, getting to this map would be uh, forward. So then. in addition to this time slider reference, we could have another kind of permanent feature. Yeah, a global index. resource with a time map. That yeah. just says, here's the time map. Yeah. Well, I think what I was... A great idea. What I was observing was more so the the narratives were great. You follow those and you're good. But uh, for those who are not initiated with Karnak, who yeah. just found this on the internet, uh, <laughs> and they're yeah. going to almost instinctively at some point press the go play by yourself button, and that's where they're going to end up somewhere upside down, not certain where they are. And I mean they can go back. So um, I also found, and it. it may have to do with how, uh, hardware acceleration, so it may not be related to anything. But the more responsive the hardware, the harder it was to control when you're not on script. Mm -hmm. So when you're off exploring on your own, it's really easy to go flying through the whole thing and end yeah. up way right. on the other side looking out into space. Right. So I, again, I realize these are all not simple. Well, that, that's actually a software question. Right, yeah. And, and one thing that we've discussed is putting a speed governor. Mm. I mean, something else yeah. we, could, we could do in Karnak. That the would model. be a really good idea. Um, we can also put a bounding dome. Yeah. We don't have one of those, so you can go flying up into space. Um, kind of fun. Kind of fun. Super <laughs> 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 <Yeah. coughs> That's a good idea. Speed limit so that 
you're not losing control. Right? Well, or you don't want to see because on, on, on some on some computers it's really slow. So yes. Is that, is there then there's the other problem, and I tried it on some slow hardware, and I not only found the slowness, but I found if you don't have, uh, is this leveraging OpenGL for chance, or um, do you know what it's? Sorry, it I don't mean to get. On, it sits on OSG. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, depending on the graphics drivers, you get a lot of um, zebra striping on, you know, your diagonals, which is a little distracting, but. Yeah. No, the thing I was worried about is it's like any other good narrative. Um, it's a bit like watching a movie and they have five commercials intersected when people are kind of following a train of thought and then suddenly they lose it. You know, I can get back to it and all of us can probably get back to it. But if somebody was coming to this model new, they might not as easily be able to get back to it. Well, or you just don't let them float around. <laughs> we are asking a lot from our user in terms of if you're actually going to try to follow an academic argument within mm -hmm. this space, you have to do right. a lot of work. Yeah. Right. Um, and so we realize that, and we're just hoping that our reviewers are up to the challenge, right. um, that mm -hmm. we're giving them multiple ways of interacting with and interrogating mm -hmm. what we've done, mm -hmm. and that we hope instead of them finding that frustrating, they find it invigorating. Right. Mm -hmm. I will add a, a software, again, hopping out to the technology, it is possible with the current prototype to export a model wherein the user is restricted mm -hmm. to only interaction with the narrative or the embedded resources. So that we, we take right. free flight off the table completely. That's what would depend on your audience right. and how you felt right. they would interact. Right. I mean, I think the power of it is that you can just yeah. step out mm -hmm. and yes. go forward. That's right. true. But yeah. And I mean, one of our goals by with this in-world annotation with the embedded resources is to allow um, other, you know, faculty, art historians, et cetera, who are interested in this model for a completely different set of purposes to then be able to go through and explore and look at the parts of Karnak that they are interested in. And so that by creating a locked narrative that doesn't allow people to get off of our narrative, that totally negates that capability, right. so we want it to be explorable. And so that's why we've added all this rich content that's not related to a narrative, so that that exploration has as much discovery and interest and information as all, you know, almost as much as doing it through a narrative. I think the narratives have to be more explicit. If I could tell you, if I was, were to channel a curmudgeon, <laughs> uh, oh. It's, you know, it's got some pretty things. It's just a guidebook. You know, I, it's just a bunch, like watching somebody's slideshow or movies, but there's, I didn't see anything historical. It's good for teaching, yeah. but there was no argument. I didn't see an argument. Where were so, the So you, you mean the argumentation in a narrative, if that's what it's intended, needs to be very explicit. Very explicit. Now, whether you say, we're only going to do one or two narratives to show you what that's like, and then hopefully you get the idea and you can, you know, do the other colors. Right. Um, but to say, we have definite argumentation in each one of these, mm -hmm. but we're letting it, we're conveying that through movement and 3D representation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's mm -hmm. enough. I think you have to really say, here's what it is, and at the end, here's what it was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. literally, at this moment. Sorry. Uh, any kind of audio? Like, component like Diane suggested, the YouTube, uh, for the, for just learning how to use it, but also just having a, a, a voiceover uh, guiding you through. I think people are used to um, movies and videos where you get the uh, the kind of interactive 3D visual, but also um, audio that's guiding you. And I think that's kind of, that might help in, in terms of making an argument or just having a sort of introduction. Sometimes I think an abstract and a little kind of video fly through. And just so you get like the, just the argument in advance, and then you know how to pr approach the narrative itself. <coughs> um, and that something might you could turn off. Right, yeah, just something to help tie it together. I think might actually bring it much more into the, as a narrative, 
it's having it certainly employees. links in more with how students study nowadays. I mean, yes. to my surprise, my students say I really prefer <coughs> to watch a video than to read a right. book. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when I, when I when I when I see video, I'm, I'm yes. more stiff. There's no information. It's just too slow. That's, I have the same so, reaction to videos. I get really bored because I have to sit there and listen through the, the you know, it's a very yeah. temporal thing. Yeah. Whereas, but I think a lot of people now are very used to videos yeah. as a medium, but. I mean, I'd rather read it because then I can scan it and get through it. But when you're doing something like this, which is a narrative, and you do have to progress <coughs> through your stages in, in a temporal way, having uh, something like a video narrative, even if it's not like uh, one thing, but if it's broken up into into resources, which you can, that I don't know, it it might help. You might just experiment. Well, yeah. and and you could do different levels of information. You could do the factual information in the text level. But then have a more evocative um, narrative in a voiceover where you really more go into what it means rather than what. But there's no way, I mean, that's harder to cite. And that's, I feel like part of this as being, of trying to get a traditional academic argumentation, we're already doing something that's very non traditional in terms mm -hmm. of here's this visual argument. But then, if we're asking people to cite oral arguments that are not written in text, they could be. I mean, they, they could actually have a, a transcript which goes with it, which has the, the citation mm -hmm. number. So mm -hmm. the only difference is that somebody would be reading it. And the only reason I say that is just it's just as a, as a design feature that that <coughs> sound goes really well with this kind of image, yeah. and that just might make it more accessible to people, not changing the actual content, but just mm -hmm. kind of making that. The what first time you the fact that like the narrative points, like if we had sound associated with each narrative, that when you jump back and forth though, then it would be replaying the same thing. How you have to be turning things on and off. Yeah, it's a pretty sophisticated sound right. controller for something. I mean, like there that. could just be a version of the narrative which is an audio version. I, I'm not, I well, haven't thought yeah, through, obviously. Yeah, right. piece of comes up, you could choose to play it if you wanted to. Right. Yeah. So right. it could and be, there's, just, a, whole, there's a whole, wouldn't play. Yeah, yeah, there's a whole sequence of sound clips available on, on a website somewhere, and you can double click that to launch. You know, right. <coughs> talking about sound, I mean, I've been daydreaming about something like this that could be you know, a reconstruction of cathedral where you have included discussion of the acoustics. And how under a redesign, the sound it might have sounded a little bit different, you know, and someone might have actually done all of the mathematics to work out how it might have sounded different, and then you could. You link to the that sort of multimedia sort of thing, but that's technically much more possible. But yeah, but technically possible. Possible, yeah. yeah. And this but is Mary. Can I can Hi, Mary. I can I interject just one quick comment? Yeah, because I I think what I'm hearing is what I see my kids doing all the time, which is doing Minecraft by watching people who've made videos about Minecraft that walk them through everything as a narrative. And there, it's like just another resource. It's this small story that's on, you know, an, a, a video basically. Right. And the, those could just become more, you know, other resources that, that you know, see a walkthrough of or, you know, hear so-and-so talking about, uh, you right. know, a particular feature. So it could be just, they, they could become just another resource. And theoretically, it could be um, Egyptologists from around the world making yeah. these same sorts of narrative discussions, voiceovers of captured model footage. Yeah. Yeah. In theory. Mary, you've been very quiet, save for this <laughs> comment. Do you have any other thoughts? Um, well, no, I'm kind of just soaking it all in, which is great. And um, I'm going to have a lot of, like, technical questions. Um, but I, I, I like the way, you know, they're – that you're thinking about this, you know, as something that can be cited as a scholarly product that can be, you know, used for, um, you know, tenure and so on. So, um, but no, I think I'm liking what I'm seeing as far as what we're trying to do or thinking about doing. This this is giving me lots of great ideas. And, um, you know, I started thinking about a, a lot of the, uh, the things I'm seeing with, um, I mean, my kids play Minecraft all the time, so I'm always seeing this, so it's always in my head. Um, but, you know, how they how they introduce the kids to the environment and introduce them to the tools is often through these videos. And 
um, you know, as I'm seeing you walk through this with us, I'm thinking you should do a video <laughs> walking people through this. Um, but no, I think it's it's great, and I really like the idea of having the map, you know, the you know the overview of the of the site, and uh, having that be kind of a constant resource is um, great. I think having um, when you guys were talking about having like a compass, even that would just kind of show which direction you're facing might be good because I know you know where the sun is and where the sun was at certain times of the day could be important to the temple itself. So anyway, those are my thoughts so far. Okay, thank you. Hmm? The first time you go to use it, you are so wrapped up in how to use it, what each thing is, that you don't even have time to think about the narrative mm -hmm. or argument. Yeah, I mean, it's the navigation with the, all the temporal materials, the pop-ups, the textual narrative, it, it is a lot. Um, so, I mean, one of our hopes is that as more and more people use VSIM and use Unity and use these um, players, is that then the next time they do a peer review, they already know how to use it. And they don't have to do all of these instructions from scratch, but they say, okay, I know how to use this basically. Marie has a few things in here that are like special to her project that I need to, oh, this functionality that I haven't been using before, and add these new skills to my skill set. But then it's not this constant have to start from scratch with every time you're using this new program. So, I mean, that would be the ideal is that we would actually at some point have people reviewing 3D projects that don't need to learn the viewer at all. On my wish list, I would, I'm going to add to that long list, <clears throat> like to be able to move at a human pace. You know, we zip through it. It's huge, complex. Just a sample of that, or if it's related to your argumentation. But to walk from one end of that to the other would take, you know, how many minutes? Yeah. Just so you have a sense, because in gaming, where everybody's just going at 100 miles an hour, and that's not how anybody experiences these environments. A, a software change could <coughs> put you as a governor, put a governor on you and let you kind of fix human whatever. A mm -hmm. simple change with within what we built is some portion of the narrative actually has been calculated, so the time it does take to move from one node to another. If it's important to your argument, if you're saying for a bark to be carried from here to here, which is a heavy thing, it would have taken half an hour. Yeah, I mean, that would be a really useful <coughs> software addition so that those people who are really thinking about what does it mean to move human pace through individual spaces, if you're trying to recreate a ritual, right, um, to sort of have that inherent within the model itself that it's going at whatever, 1.5 miles an hour or something would probably be really a useful thing. I have my software development hat on, <laughs> and that's actually a challenge for generalizable software because people build in different units. So mm -hmm. you can't just say X units per second of travel means 15 feet and a human scale. You have to define what units the model has been built in, whether it's centimeters, inches, meters, feet, whatever and then transplant that. So to put in that kind of governor in the software then requires a couple of extra steps. I was even being dumber than that. <laughs> I was being dumb. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. <laughs> um, I was just saying in, in one of the texts. Yeah, in the narrative. In the narrative. And that's the easy yeah. solution. I love that solution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say, to walk from here to here, it would be. Right. Note that you're going at a much faster speed. Yeah, right. <coughs> um, I was curious about how you see this vSIM package uh, in relation to the Digital Cornac website. Because I don't, is, is there overlap of content? Are they linked together and meant to be viewed uh, a, concurrently? Are they completely separate? Uh, how do they address different? questions and 
So the embedded resources are almost exclusively, I would say 90%, um, directly from the Digital Karnak website. So we'd already done all of the work to put together this information, the bibliography, um, the reconstruction information, the general information on these spaces. So we reused that from the Digital Karnak website sort of directly um, for all, all, about 90% of the embedded resources. And just yeah. saying, yeah, and just the narratives themselves yeah. are completely new, and so those are sort of argumentations or tours through the space you know, on which I'm drawing from the Digital Karnak website, but that material is new to these sounds. So you would, for example, have a version of the narrative in, on the web page with the text sort of laid out in a web standard format with um, with the, the sort of node structure in a hierarchy, just as a kind of companion piece? I mean, would you think that's necessary, or is it well, not? We do have, in the Karnak website, I have thematic essays, including okay. one like on the chronology of Karnak. So theoretically, <laughs> all of the buildings that I talk about in that coming in are indeed the ones that you see that are happening in yeah. the model. So I have this sort of, you know, build a feature added, feature subtracted kind of um, breakdown in a PDF format. So that is something that we could um, associate more directly with the chronology narrative, for example. I mean, right now, theoretically, you could open the model and just be reading that and time sliding and watching all of the things come in at each rate of each case, right? And so it, it would sort of match up directly with that um, PDF article. But it's not referencing the nodes because that was written before the speed version was made. Right, yeah. <coughs> so then I'm showing that. Yeah, so exactly. I have I wrote a basically phase by phase and then a plus sign for things that features that have been added and a minus sign for features that were subtracted or altered. So rain by rain and then building by building. Yeah. The same way you would interact with the Karnak model. I'm just thinking about the way these things have a life in the digital world and when they're published, are you thinking that the thing that's we've been talking about today is the digital the publication of 3D content, are you just talking about the vSIM package <coughs> which is going to be downloadable? Because I feel like people when they're looking at 3D content or, their, or digital projects at all, they expect a link to a website which is going to present it to them on the web. And no matter if they have to then download something or then link to something, but they kind of want a URL with a home page and you know, all that kind of, which is what you have in Digital Carnex. So I was wondering if you see those as linked or if you see the, the VSIM as just a completely separate thing, which is going to have no, its own life within the. It will definitely go here. And we're in the process of moving this over to the library, but where we have a link to the Google Earth version of this, we'll also have a link to the VSIM version of this. So it will all be interconnected. And each of the, the red embedded resources directly move out to the Digital Karnak website. So we've consciously sent the viewer there numerous times for each feature to go to that feature page. Yeah. So they have a more traditional narrative um, that might be repeated in the embedded resources in a certain way, but they're sort of, we, we try to make these two things join together. We did all the work to make this website, so we figured we should capitalize on it and to allow people to get access to that knowledge in whatever way they were most comfortable. And we also have a lot of extra content on the website that isn't included in the model. Right. So, so why did you make the model? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's, you're going to be That's part that. of my question because it kind of like, <clears throat> I think the model needs all the, all the web content. Um, yeah. But you need to have a reason, you know, like, I, I mean, I can understand <coughs> the purpose of the, the model narrative, but it's, it's tricky for me when I'm thinking about how to present my project eventually, like, uh, what kind of web presence do I give, give it, yeah. and so I'm just curious about different strategies. I mean, there are, you can do almost everything on the web these days. Yeah. So, things that you still can't do, and then on the web you still have these platform dependencies, someone's looking at it in a different browser and things behave differently, right. and stuff like that. So, I mean, an independent model like, or platform like VSIM is also always going to be
that much more controllable. And you always be able to do things in a much more controlled environment and, and do more. But it would be nice if um, the elements that you want to capture, like narratives, and you wanted to sort of, I guess, putting on the web has two advantages. One is it's more universally available and therefore acts as a place where people can go to get it without relying on the software. Um, but it's also a good archival platform because it gets scraped and saved right. in the Internet Archive forever. So right. Whatever happens to these those elements. It would be nice to be able to sort of like create a narrative, push a button, capture it, have it sit somewhere. You mean? You got the button already. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that is really useful, actually, just to be able to have a, some static output that you can save and link to. You know. and we have a, we have a fellow down in the lab, Jacob Bomber, mm -hmm. who has done a lot of photo scan modeling, and to use that in presentations. He has taken it from PhotoScan and brought it into vSIM, made a narrative, and then just done a screen capture of that movie and embedded that movie into his PowerPoint presentation or conferences. Because I, I see a lot of people doing that, actually, just making movies and putting it in a PowerPoint. So it was kind of like vSIM, but the, like a hacked version. <laughs> right, right. <coughs> Does the movie maker work already? Uh, it does, but it only captures a very tiny thing, and it, yeah. it, it was an attempt to do it in real time. So uh, as, as, as it's capturing in real time, it, the latency is a problem. So you yeah. kind of have to do really short ones. So it's, it's not it's not the movie maker of our dreams. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, as we round up to 3 o'clock, it seems like we've exhausted the conversation, um, and I appreciate appreciate everyone's feedback and would love to hear um, more thoughts later if they strike you. And um, if you any of you have any closing remarks, I think now would be the time.